Hello everyone and welcome back to another lecture video for Math 110 Introduction to Number Theory. And what we will talk about in this video is divisibility, divisors, and division for the integers. So let's start off by recalling what the integers are. The integers are the natural numbers along with all the negatives sort of added in in a formal way. And it's the number system that extends the natural numbers to have subtraction. Um, in a companion video, we'll go into some details about what that means. And just as a side note, the reason that it's Z for the integers, instead of I or something uh, that would make some sense, is that the German for number is Zollen. So the definition of A divides B, when A and B are integers, which is notated A bar B, is that there exists a solution to the equation B equals KA where k is uh, some integer. Um, and so when a does not divide b, just so you know the notation, that is a bar with a slash b. So let's look at some examples. Uh, one thing is, let's see, 3 divides 15. And that is true because we can write that 15 is 5 times 3. Uh, and so k is 5. One thing that we'll be able to do in this lecture is show that 2 does not divide 7, um, which through your experience you probably believe, but we do need to show that there's not some k out there in the world for which uh, 7 is 2 times that k. Um, 57 is 19 times 3, I believe. So that is, uh, so 19 does divide 57. And this is known as the Gertendieck prime. Gertendieck was this uh, mathematician who revolutionized a subject called algebraic geometry. And he infamously did not like concrete examples. So one time somebody asked him like, okay, give me an example of this theorem being true. And it had to, it involved needing a prime number. And so Gertendieck was just like, okay, let P be 57 having no idea that it was not actually a prime. Okay, so another sort of uh, thing that might be a little counterintuitive is that every number divides zero. And the reason for that is simply that, for example, 91 is, I, I mean, uh, zero is equal to zero times 91. So setting k to be zero uh, shows that it does divide. Also, uh, let's see, 0 does not divide 1. This is something that we can show right now. This would involve solving that 1 is k times 0, but nothing, but k, everything times 0 is 0, and 1 is not 0. And some terminology. So if a divides b, then we say that a is a divisor of b. And so we can speak of the set of all divisors of a number. Let's now look at an analogy between the integers and the natural numbers, and in particular, the divisibility relation and the less than or equal to relation. So uh, there's a very s strong parallel between them. So let's compare the definitions. So from the previous slide, um, a divides b if there exists an integer k such that ka equals b. And then for the natural numbers, we defined m is less than or equal to n by whether there exists a k such that k plus m equals n. So uh, less than or equal to is to addition as divisibility is to multiplication. So it's the multiplicative structure versus the additive structure that these two relations are looking at. And so reiterating, the less than or equal to relation is whether a certain additive equation is solvable for natural numbers. And the divisibility relation is whether this multiplicative equation is solvable for integers. And just for fun of the fun of it, while I was preparing this lecture, I was thinking, well, if the integers are when we add in negatives and the rationals are when we add in reciprocals, then I suppose that there could be another relation, and I just made this notation up, which is whether a particular exponential equation is solvable. For the purpose of understanding less than or equal to and divisibility better, let's introduce the concept of a poset, which is short for a partially ordered set. 
And just like how in linear algebra, a vector space was this abstract definition which talked about some unspecified uh, set of vectors and some unspecified addition and scalar multiplication operation, a post set um, starts with some unspecified set P and some unspecified uh, relation, uh, which I'm writing as curly less than or equal to. And uh, just by the way, a binary relation in general is something for which whenever you have two elements of the set in question, then uh, A related to B is either true or false. So we say that P with this relation is a post set if three things hold. One, that the relation is reflexive, which is that for every element of the set, then A is related to itself. Two, that the relation is transitive, which is that for all, uh, whenever you have three elements of the set, and if the first two are related and the second two are related, then the first is related to the third. And then three, that the relation is anti-symmetric, which is that if you have two elements that are related to each other in both ways, then they must have been equal. So uh, as sort of an exercise to get our feet wet with this definition, let's show that less than or equal to gives n the structure of a post set. So we have to show three things, that less than or equal to is reflexive, transitive, and anti-symmetric. So let's start with the first. Um, to show that it's reflexive, um, what we have to do is supposing that we have some natural number, then show that a is less than or equal to itself. And so remember the definition of less than or equal to was that you can add something to the first number to get the second number. And if we just add zero, then we get, the sec we get itself, right? So it's um, true by definition using zero. Now let's show that it's transitive. So that is assuming that we have three numbers given to us, along with the fact that the first is less than or equal to the second, and the second is less than or equal to the third, then we have to show that the first is less than or equal to the third. So let's use the definition of less than or equal to to then let k and l be two natural numbers such that k plus a is b and l plus b is c. And so now through some algebra, we calculate that um, if we use l plus k and add it to a, then we can reassociate then use the fact that k plus a is b and replace that, and then re use the fact that l plus b is c, and then get that. And so by definition of less than or equal to, we have just shown that a is less than or equal to c. Okay, now anti-symmetry. And that is assuming that we have two numbers given to us where the they are related to each other in both ways, then we want to show that a actually equals b. So um, this is very similar to transitivity. We show, okay, so given that a is less than or equal to b, and uh, there is a k such that k plus a equals b, and similarly, there's an l such that l plus b is a. So then plugging in l plus, or so then taking l plus k and adding a, then we can reassociate, and then similarly turn that into l plus b, and then turn that into a. So we've shown that some number plus a is itself. Uh, the natural numbers have a cancellation law for addition, so we can cancel the a on both sides to get l plus k equals zero. And then um, another property of addition is that when you have two numbers added together and get zero, then they're both zero. So uh, we have that k is zero. And then using this equation, we have uh, that a is b by plugging k a uh, zero in for k. One way to visualize a post set is through something called a Hasse diagram. So given a post set p with a relation, we write a under b with a line between them for when a is not equal to b and also when a comes before b according to the partial order. So for qu clarity, we take advantage of transitivity and erase lines that we don't actually need. They're ones that uh, come sort of for free from the other ones. So if a is less than or equal to b, which is less than or equal to c, then by transitivity, a is less than or equal to c, so we don't need that line. So here's an example of a simple Hasse diagram. For the set 0, 1, and we take 
all the subsets of it. So P is the set of subsets of 0, 1, and we use the subset of relation for the post set. This ends up being a post set. So for example, the empty set is contained in the set containing 0, and it's contained in the set containing 1. And also, both of those sets are subsets of 0, 1. Uh, and also, there's the implicit line of the empty set being a subset of 0, 1. Or a more exciting post set, the subsets of a three element set, uh, again with the subset of relation. And it makes this cube structure. So the empty set is contained in all the one element sets, which are contained in all the two element sets, which are contained in the three element set. And in general, if you have a set of n elements, you'll get some n dimensional hypercube. Okay, so now that we know that less than or equal to with n, it gives you a post set. Let's look at its Hasse diagram. And it's very simple. It's that 0 is less than or equal to 1, is less than or equal to 2, is less than or equal to 3, and so on. And every other line just kind of comes from that. So this is known as a total order, or a linear order, because it's like a line. And I think it's safe to say that we, we basically completely understand how less than or equal to works. Our next goal is to try to understand divisibility better. So there's one complication, which is that the integers with divides don't quite form a post set. And the problem is that uh, the anti-symmetry of divides fails. So for example, 5 divides minus 5, because minus 1 times 5 is minus 5, and similarly minus 5 divides 5. And if it were anti-symmetric, the conclusion would be that 5 is minus 5, but that's definitely not true. However, this plus minus problem is the only real failure. And every integer is plus or minus to some natural number. So what we can do is instead consider the natural numbers with the divides relation. And in fact, the natural numbers with the divides relation is a post set. So to do that, we show the three things, anti uh, reflexivity, transitivity, and anti-symmetry. And all of this parallels quite closely how uh, showing less than or equal to gave a partial order. So reflexivity. Let's suppose that we have a natural number a, and we want to show that a divides a. Um, this is straightforward. We show, well, 1 times a is a. And so by definition of divides, a divides a. Great. So for transitivity now, let's say that we were given three numbers, a, b, and c, where a divides b and b divides c. So it suffices to show that the first number divides the third. Um, by definition of divisibility, we have that uh, there are two integers, k and l, such that ka equals b and lb equals c. Um, so we can calculate that l times k times a is c by applying these equations and after reassociating. And so by definition of divisibility, using lk as the number, we get that a divides c. Okay, how about anti-symmetry? This is a little bit more involved because the cancellation law for multiplication uh, is slightly more complicated from the fact that zero behaves in a somewhat different way from other numbers. Okay, so let's suppose that a and b are natural numbers where each divides the other. So what we wanna show is that a equals b. So just like in transitivity, there exists some k and l such that k a equals b and l b equals a. One thing to note is that because a and b are both natural numbers, we can prove that k and l must also be natural numbers um, because positive times a negative would be negative. Okay, so also like transitivity, we can show that lk times a is a. And so now let's handle two cases, depending on whether or not a is zero. When a is zero, then what we can do is take the first equation, ka equals b, and plug zero, uh, 0 in for a, and then that shows us that b is 0. And 0 equals 0, so they're equal. And then case 2 is that a is not 0. And when a is not 0, we can cancel it from both sides to get lk equals 1. And whenever a product of natural numbers is 1, you can prove that both of them were 1. And in particular, k was 1. And so, again, using the first equation uh, for divisibility, we get that b is k times a is a, so b equals a. 
and so we're done. So the natural numbers with divisibility form a post set. So let's look at its Hasse diagram. Um, so I've only represented the first 21 numbers starting from zero, and, um, and it's fairly complicated, a lot more complicated than less than or equal to. So our goal is to understand the structure of this Hasse diagram completely. We won't do that in this lecture entirely, um, but we're going to start laying the framework for how we're going to do that. Um, so let's just take a moment, though, to see what we do have. So first of all, at the very bottom, we have 1, which is known as a unit. Um, then there's a layer right above it of these numbers, which we'll define in a future video. And these are called the primes. And then above that are all these other numbers that have divisors. And at the very top is zero, which every number divides. Uh, and so it's, it's fairly special. Now what we'll do is start proving some properties of divisibility that will help us make some sense of the mess of lines in the Hasse diagram. Okay, so the first theorem is that if we have three integers, where the first divides the second and the first divides the third, then the first divides the sum of the second and the third. So by definition, there exists two integers, k and l, such that ka equals b and la equals c. So um, what we can calculate is that the sum of k and l times a by distributivity is ka plus la, and that is b plus c using our equations. And by definition, a is a, a divisor of b plus c. So that is done. Here's another theorem. If we have three integers where the first divides the second, then we can scale the third and still have a divide it. So again, by definition, there is some k that's an integer such that ka equals b. And then we calculate that cka is c times ka by reassociating. And ka is b. So we see that a divides cb by definition. So that's done. And so combining these two theorems, divisibility satisfies a kind of linearity property. So supposing that uh, a is an integer, b1 through bn are integers, and c1 through cn are integers, and also for each i, a divides bi, then a divides the linear combination of all the bi's using the ci's as scalars. So I invite you to prove this yourself as an exercise, and it's an application of induction. Now as an application of the previous corollary, let's look at this example from the textbook. Um, and the question is, is it possible to make change for $5 with exactly 100 coins, where the coins are pennies, dimes, and quarters? Um, the first thing we'll do is immediately translate this into a linear system of equations. So the first equation is that it, the number of pennies plus the number of dimes plus the number of quarters is 100. And then the second equation is that the number of pennies plus 10 times the number of dimes plus 25 times the number of quarters is 500 cents. And by the way, uh, systems of equations where all the variables are supposed to be integers are known as linear Diophantine systems, where Diophantine is referring to the Greek mathematician Diophantus. Okay, like usual for solving linear systems, let's uh, Let's do some sort of cancellation by subtracting one equation from the other. So we'll subtract the first equation from the second, and that leaves us with 9d plus 24q is 400. So notice two things. One, 3 divides 9, and another, 3 divides 24. And so by the corollary, 3 divides 9 times something plus 24 times something. Um, and so because the equation says that this is 400, then 3 divides 400. So this is all assuming that we, if we had a solution, then a consequence to that would be that 3 divided 400. And as we'll check in a bit, using some rigorous methods, 3 does not divide 400, so it's impossible to make change in this way. An important aspect of the integers is division with remainder. Given two integers, a and b, where b is positive, we say that we've divided a by b with quotient q and remainder r, where q and r are integers, if two properties hold. One, that a is qb plus r, and two, that 
r is greater than or equal to zero and less than b. And uh, just graphically, as, so thinking of a, both a and b as being positive, then what we're doing is we're finding a way to create a rectangle, which is uh, q on one side and b on the other, along with an extra little sliver of area r and side length one, such that the total area of this is a. Okay, so there are two theorems associated with this. One is that division can actually be carried out, and another is that uh, it can be carried out uniquely. There are, well, once you've divided, Q and R are the only things that it could have ever been. So the first theorem is the division algorithm, which is that it can be carried out. So let A and B be as in the definition. And the way the proof goes is an application of the well-ordering principle from last time. So let's let S be the set of all natural numbers R, such that property one is satisfied, which is that there exists an integer Q such that A equals QB plus R. So to apply the well-ordering principle, we need that S is non-empty. Um, so that is our first claim. So there are two cases because we're allowing A to be negative. So case one is that um, a is greater than or equal to zero. And for this, we can use Q equals zero and R equals A because A equals zero B plus A. Uh, and we don't need two to be satisfied for the set, so that shows that, um, that there is an element in here, namely A. Case two is that A is less than zero. So we have that A times B is less than or equal to A since B is positive. And so there exists an R such that R plus AB equals A by definition of less than or equal to. And then we can use Q equals A because then A equals A times B plus R, which shows that it's an element of the set. So th since this is a subset of the natural numbers and it's non-empty, by the well-ordering principle, there is a least element, r. So um, since r is an element of s, let's let q be the integer such that a equals qb plus r. So what we want to show now is that property 2 is satisfied for this, because by the definition of r, we know that property 1 is already satisfied. Okay, so our claim is that r is less than b. And let's prove this by a contradiction. So we're supposing that it's not the case, and instead that b is less than or equal to r. Then by definition of less than or equal to, there's some k that's a natural number such that k plus b r. And then we can calculate that qb plus r is qb plus k plus b. And then we have a b showing up twice, so we can undistribute and get q plus 1 b plus k. But um, this shows that k is an element of s because we, this is equal to a at the beginning of this equation. And k is strictly less than r because this k plus b equal r equation is also a proof that k is less than or equal to r, and we assume that b was positive. Okay, and this is contradicting that r was the least element in that set. And so therefore, we can instead claim that r is indeed strictly less than b. And so therefore, we've divided a by b with quotient q and remainder r. So that's the division algorithm. Now let's see why this deserves to be called an algorithm. So an another way to think about the set s from the proof of the theorem is by solving the equation for r, uh, we can instead write it as the set of all a minus qb for varying q in the integers with the property that a minus qb is non-negative. So for sake of demonstration, let's see uh, what this looks like when a is non-negative. So starting with a, we can repeatedly subtract b uh, until we get a number that is less than b. And the second claim in the theorem was that if we subtract b once more, we get a negative number. And so therefore, this would be the remainder 
with Q being the quotient. So the algorithm is simply, uh, when both A and B are positive, keep subtracting B from A until you get a negative number, and then the previous step is the quotient and remainder. And well ordering is the property that lets us know that this process indeed terminates. Now that we've seen that division exists, let's show that division is unique, which means that if we have two sets of quotients and remainders, so q, q prime, r, and r prime, such that property one holds for these all four numbers and also property two holds for the two remainders, then we can conclude that q equals q prime and r equals r prime. Um, so one thing we can assume to simplify the argument is that r is less than or equal to r prime, and the way that we can do that is swap q and q prime and r and r prime if necessary, if that doesn't hold. So by definition of this inequality, we know that there's some k that's a natural number such that r plus k equals r prime. And so uh, using the equation, or and so q prime b plus r prime, substituting in r prime is q prime b plus r plus k. Okay, so let's write zero in a fancy way as a minus a, and we have two different ways of writing a. One is qb plus r, and the other is q prime b plus r prime. So substituting in this thing we just calculated, we can get that uh, q minus q prime times b minus k is zero. And so, in particular, k is q minus q prime times b. So uh, I guess b divides k if you want. So there are two cases that we'll look at. The first is whether q is q prime and the other is if q is not q prime. So if q equals q prime, then we have k is zero. And then substituting that in for uh, the, this equation, we get r equals r prime. Um, and since q equals q prime, then we're done with that case. Case two is that q is not q prime and this will result in a contradiction in all ways. So um, let's let m, just for notational simplicity, be q minus q prime, which isn't zero. And so just substituting m in, we have that k equals m times b. So now there are two cases that we'll look at. Um, case one is that m is negative, and case two is that m is positive. And we don't have m equals zero because we're assuming it's not zero. So if m is zero, then since b is greater than zero, um, that shows that k would be less than zero, but that is a contradiction because k is a natural number. So case b, that m is positive. Then um, there's some n such that m equals n plus one. It's the successor of a number. And we have that r prime is r plus k from before. And then k is m times b. And then m is n plus one, in which we expand it out, we get r plus nb plus b, which is greater than or equal to b because we're adding some numbers to b. However, r prime is less than b by assumption, and so that's a contradiction. Uh, so both these cases resulted in contradictions, so case two just doesn't happen. And so therefore, um, q is q prime and r is r prime. And so division exists and it's unique. Let's go back to the coin example just to wrap it up. So we claim that three does not divide 400. So rewriting what that means, uh, by definition, it's that there does not exist a k such that three k equals 400. And we can rewrite that as 400 equals three k plus zero, which is that when we divide 400 by three, we get a quotient k with remainder zero. So let's see what the remainder is. Um, and we can do this by basically long division, uh, which I'll do in this way. So given 400, then we can subtract three times 100 from it to make it smaller, but still positive. And that's 100. And let's subtract three times 30 um, to get 10, and then subtract three times three to get one, which is less than three. And so in each of these cases, I'm subtracting some multiple of three. And through this, we can see that what we did was it showed that 400 is three times 100 plus 30 plus three plus one. So this number right here is the quotient and that's the remainder of one. 
And by uniqueness of division, we can conclude then that 3 does not divide 400. Let's go back to something that we showed in the previous video, which was that every natural number is either even or odd. Um, and now that we have the division algorithm, there is a much more straightforward proof because we've already wrapped up all the well ordering principle stuff in division. So let's suppose that n is a natural number and we want to show that there exists a k such that n equals 2k or n equals 2k plus 1. So by division, there exists a quotient and a remainder such that n equals 2q plus r and 0 is less than or equal to r, which is less than 2. Um, since we're trying to prove existence of a k, um, let's plug in k equals q because I know that's going to work because I did the rest of the proof already. Um, then what suffices is to show that either n equals 2q or n equals 2q plus 1. So let's now do cases on r, which we can do because we know that r is less than 2, so the only options are 0 or 1. Case 0 is that um, while well, plugging in 0 for r, it's that n equals 2q, and that is exactly uh, one, of, one of the things that we could prove. Uh, and then for r equals 1, which, which is n equals 2q plus 1, that's exactly the second one. So in each case, we could prove the first or the second thing, and so we're done. So that was quick and very nice. Given that division exists and is unique, it's convenient to have some notation for it. So let's say that a and b are integers with b positive, and let's say that q and r are the unique uh, integers solving uh, this equation and that inequality. So they're the quotient and remainder. So we'll write floor of a divided by b for q, and a percent b, or a mod b is how it's pronounced, for r. And this percent notation comes from programming languages. Um, so the idea with this floor notation is that it does extend to other number systems like the reals, where it's the largest integer less than or equal to taking the ratio a divided by b. So in other words, it's division rounded down toward minus infinity. If r is 0, then as a special case, uh, well, we don't really need to round down. So um, we'll write a divided by b for q. Um, and so r equals 0, that's also, in other words, that b divides a. So summarizing the division algorithm, it's that we can write a as the floor of a divided by b times b plus a mod b. Um, and one sort of convenient thing to remember is that we can use this to sort of define the remainder, and that is that a minus floor of a divided by b times b is the remainder. So going back to our goal, which is to better understand the Hasse diagram for divisibility, let's define common divisors and greatest common divisors. So if d divides a and d divides b, then we say that d is a common divisor of a and b. And the Hasse diagram for this situation um, is that we have a and b, and both are above d. So as an example, um, we have 12 and 18. 12 in this yellow region has the 4, 6, 2, 3, and 1 as divisors. And 18 in this orange region has uh, 18, 6, 9, 2, 3, and 1 as divisors. And so 6, 2, 3, and 1 are the common divisors of 12 and 18. The greatest common divisor is a number d that's a common divisor of a and b, such that it's the greatest um, if it exists. Uh, and the notation for this is a, b in parentheses, or g, c, d of a, b. We're going to go with the first notation. Uh, that's what the textbook uses. One thing about the definition of the greatest common divisor is it had the statement, if it exists. So what we'll do now is show that, in fact, the GCD does exist, supposing that not both A and B are 0. And furthermore, we can show that the GCD is also a positive integer. So without loss of generality, let's assume that A is the number that's non-zero 
uh, because we can swap A and B as needed, and the conclusion is symmetric in A and B. So um, now let's let S be the set of all integers D that divide both A and B. The goal is to show that S is non-empty and contains a maximal element. It's sort of a version of the well-ordering principle, but um, I guess upside down. So claim one is that it's non-empty, and in particular, we'll show that one is an element. And so one being an element of S, just uh, by definition of membership of a set, is that one divides A and one divides B. And well, this is true because well, one times A is A and one times B is B. So by definition, it's true. Okay, so now we know that S is non-empty and also that one is in it. So now the claim that I want to show is that for every e and s, then the absolute value of e is less than or equal to the absolute value of a. So what we're showing is that s is contained inside of the number line region from minus a to a. So this is where s is. Um, OK, so let's suppose e is an element of s. And um, so it suffices to show that e's absolute value is less than or equal to the absolute value of a. So since it's in S, we know one thing is that e divides a. So uh, using the definition of divisibility, there's a k in the integers such that ke equals a. Um, for some notational convenience, let's let k prime be the absolute value, which is a natural number. And then k prime times the absolute value of e is the absolute value of a by taking absolute values of both sides and using multiplicity of absolute values. So now we'll, we look at two cases. Either k prime is 0 or it's the successor of a natural number. So case 1, that it's 0. Um, then since k prime is 0, we can see that k is 0. And then since k is 0, uh, we can plug it in here and get that a is 0, but that contradicts our assumption that a was not 0. Case 2, that k prime is a successor, means that there's some k double prime in the integers, such that k prime is k double prime plus 1. Okay, so then uh, a is k prime absolute value e, and then uh, substituting in this for k prime, we get that uh, k double prime absolute value e plus absolute value e is absolute value a. And so by definition of less than or equal to, this shows that e is absolute value is less than or equal to the absolute value of a. Okay, and so case one was impossible. Case two shows the conclusion and that exhausts everything. So the claim holds. So now, Let's look at the set S intersect uh, the integers from one through absolute value of A. One thing we know is that, um, well, we're sort of splitting S into two parts and also ignoring zero. So we're taking this part of S. And um, one thing we know is that it's non-empty because one is in it. Another thing we know is that there's no element of S bigger than any element of this intersection. Um, OK, so adapting the lemma we use to prove well-ordering, instead of proving that it has a least element, we can, uh, we can change it to show that this finite set has a greatest element. Let's call this greatest element d. So by the second claim, d in, is an element of s that's greatest. And the reason that this follows from the second claim is because, well, there's no elements bigger than a, or a bigger than absolute value a, that are in s. So that's that. So yeah, GCDs exist. In the previous theorem, we assume that not both a and b are 0. But a useful convention is to set the GCD of 0 and 0 to be 0. If we strictly follow the, de the definition of GCD, this is undefined. But there are some different algebraic identities, including the following theorem that um, for which this convention makes the statement of the theorem simpler. So this theorem, Bezu's identity, is very important. And it connects the worlds of 
multiplication and addition together. Uh, and it makes it a lot easier to mani manipulate GCDs and proof, proof things about them. So let's let A and B be some integers. Then the claim is that there exists X and Y in the integers such that the GCD of AB is this integer linear combination of A and B. So first of all, let's handle the A equals B equals zero case. Then certainly we can just substitute in zero for X and Y and then it's true according to the convention. So without loss of generality, uh, let's assume A is non-zero because uh, the opposite of this is that one of the two is non-zero. So let's assume A is the one. Uh, let's let S be the set of all integer linear combinations of A and B so that are positive. So uh, the claim is that this set is non-empty. Um, and to show that it's non-empty, we can just show an element that's in it. So it suffices to show that, in particular, the absolute value of A is in S. Um, so there are two cases, one that A is positive and the other that A is negative. Um, so if, if A is positive, we can use x equals 1 and y equals 0 because uh, x or 1 times a plus 0 times b is a, which is equal to the absolute value of a in this case. And otherwise, we can use minus 1 and 0. And the minus 1 is what makes this uh, positive. Um, since s is a subset of the natural numbers, then by well ordering, there's a least element d. And so now what we're going to do is show that d is actually the GCD. Let's let x and y be some integers such that d equals x a plus y b using the definition of s. And so the claim is first that d divides a, and then by a similar argument, d divides b, and so it's um, a common divisor. So let's assume that d does not divide a. Um, and Remember, one version of not divides is that the remainder after division is not zero. Okay, so we have that formula, which is that the remainder after division is equal to a minus the floor division of a by d times d. And then we know that d is x a plus y b, so we substitute that in. Uh, and then we rearrange things to have it be something times a and something times b. And because it's something times a and something times b, um, and also since we know that this is non-negative, that means it's an element of s. However, uh, remember that the remainder after division is less than what we divided by. So that's a contradiction because we assumed that it was least. Okay, like I said, by a similar argument, d divides b, uh, just by replacing all the uh, a's with b's, and so d is a common divisor of both. Now let's show that it's the greatest common divisor. So let's suppose that d prime is another number that divides both of them. Then um, what we have is that by the uh, linearity property, d prime divides x a plus y b, and then because x a plus y b is d, d prime divides d, and because both the and because d is positive, this this implies that d prime is less than or equal to d, using the definition of divisibility. So that is Bayes' identity. So here's a point of view of uh, what the logic is. So our definition of GCD was that we look at all the common divisors and take the greatest of them. But with Bayes' identity, what we're doing is we're taking linear combinations of A and B that are positive and taking the least of them. And then surprisingly, they meet right in the middle. And uh, so that's the miraculous thing with Bayes' identity. And as an algebraic aside, if you've taken uh, abstract algebra and know a little bit about ring theory, uh, I'd like to mention that this set of all integer linear combinations of A and B is also uh, often written as ZA plus ZB. Um, and this is what's known as an ideal, which is like a vector subspace of the integers, uh, but adapted for the fact that it's the integers and it's not like a, there's no fields involved. So um, 
you can add elements of this to get another element of it, and you can scale elements of this by an integer to get other elements of it. That's an ideal. So um, the proof of Bezu's identity can be adapted to show that, in fact, this ideal is equal to ZD, where D is the GCD. So um, in other words, uh, the, the generator of this principal ideal is the GCD. Okay, so that was an algebraic aside. Um, for those who haven't taken abstract algebra like that, I'm going to give you a formulation of that previous statement, but just using some uh, basic notions. And most of this is calculations. I know it's a wall of text, but um, it is, it's fairly straightforward. Um, okay, so let's say that we have four integers with the property that the GCD of the first two is the GCD of the last two. Then the conclusion is that these sets of linear integer linear combinations are equal. And also conversely, if these sets are equal, then the GCDs are equal. So this is a, yeah, it's a very useful characterization of the GCD, linking this divisibility world into this linear combination world. So there are two claims. Uh, the, cla the first claim is the forward direction, and the second claim is the backward direction. So let's suppose that the GCDs are equal. So um, by defin what we're trying to do is show that these sets are equal, and by definition of that, we're trying to show that whenever we have an integer n, then n being in the first set is equivalent to n being in the second set. Um, so by symmetry, because we can swap the roles of a, b, and also a prime, b prime, um, we, can, we only have to prove the forward direction. So that, you know, by symmetry, it suffices to show that if n is in the first set, then n is in the second set. So let's let x and y be the integers such that n equals xa plus yb, because we're assuming that n is in the first set. So uh, since the GCD of a and b divides both a and b, um, and we assumed that these GCDs are equal, then we also have the GCD of a prime and b prime divides a and divides b. So given these two divisibility conditions, Let's let C and D be the integers, which uh, by definition exist, namely that A equals C times the GCD of A prime and B prime, and B is D times the GCD of A prime and B prime. Um, okay, so now applying Bezu's identity, the GCD of A prime and B prime is, for some integers E and F, E A prime plus F B prime. Okay, now, n is xa plus yb, as we assumed, and um, substituting in these equations for a and b, we get, after some rearranging, that x times c plus x times d uh, times the GCD of a prime and b prime is n. Uh, now, applying this thing from Bayes' identity and uh, distributing, then we have that there's some number times a prime plus some number times b prime, which is n. And that is exactly what it means for n to be an element of the second set. So we are done. Yep, so it was just some use of Bayes' identity and divisibility and a little bit of substitution. Um, now for the second claim, that the reverse direction holds. So we're supposing that these two sets are equal, and we want to show that the GCDs then are equal. Um, so by intersecting both of these sets with the, not, uh, with the positive integers, then we have that, uh, well, xa plus yb, the set of those, where those are positive, is equal to the set of the corresponding thing for the a primes and b primes that are positive. And if we recall the proof of Bayes' identity, the GCD was the least element of each of these. And since these sets are equal, then their least elements are equal. So um, assuming that these are non-empty, then we have the GCDs are equal. And also, they might be empty. The only way that these sets could be empty is if um, 
both a and b are zero and both a prime and b prime are zero, in which case the conclusion also holds. So that's the second claim. And these claims were sufficient to prove the if and only if, so we have proved the theorem. So this is a very useful characterization of the GCD. It might be helpful to see a linear algebra analogy. So the GCD is measuring in some sense how well the numbers span Z. Um, if the GCD of A and B is not, uh, is not one, then what this is saying is that the set of all integer linear combinations of these two numbers is strictly a subset of Z. So they do not span. And in fact, when uh, the GCD is one, then it's an equality and they do span. So uh, let's look at a couple examples. So example one, um, the GCD of three and five. So we can just exhaustively look at all the common divisors, uh, well, all the divisors of three and five, and one is the only one. So one is the greatest common divisor. Um, so let's look at um, what numbers can we get using integer linear combinations of these. Uh, and so these vectors that we're looking at are just pointing in the direction of the number line. And so first, let's start at zero. So starting from zero, if we go three in the positive direction, so apply the three vector, and go five in the minus direction, uh, apply the five vector, and then three again, then we're left at one. So um, doing a little of algebra, then we see that one is two times three plus minus one times five. Uh, and one thing we can see from this is that because we were able to get one, then we're able to get every integer because um, we multiply both sides of that equation by n. Yeah, so three and five in some sense span z. Uh, now let's look at four and six. So we, uh, we can exhaustively find all the divisors. So the divisors of four are two and one and four itself. And the divisors of six are six, two, three, and one. And the common divisors are uh, just two and one, and two is the greatest. So that's the GCD. And again, we can uh, follow these uh, vectors associated to four and six to try to see what we can get. And in particular, let's try to get two. So I just kind of aimlessly thought, oh, let's go forward by four, then back by six, then forward by four. And that just was something that got me to. So. Uh, we see that 2 is 2 times 4, because we went in the 4 direction twice, and then um, minus 1 times 5, because we went in the 5 direction, I guess, minus 1 times. So one thing that we see then is that for every integer, in per or like every even integer, so every 2n, we can then write it as some integer linear combination of 4 and 5. Let's take a look at some more properties of the GCD and how it relates to divisibility. Um, okay, so if we have three integers, a, b, and d, where d divides a and d divides b, then d divides the GCD of a and b. So this is the, uh, rather than the less than or equal to version of the definition of GCD, this is giving us some sort of divisibility version of GCD, which is that it's not only greatest in magnitude, but also greatest according to divis divisibility with the partial order. Um, okay, so by Bayes' identity, the GCD of a and b is xa plus yb for some x and y in the integers. And since d divides a and d divides b, by the linearity property, d divides xa plus yb, which equals the GCD, so d divides the GCD. So that was quick. Um, here's another property. If you negate one of the numbers in the GCD, then it remains the same. So we'll use this linear combination point of view to prove this. Um, okay, so it, to show that these are equal, it suffices to show that their corresponding sets of linear combinations are equal. So for the GCD of minus a and b, its set is the set of all x times minus a plus y times b for x and y. And we can take that minus sign and put it on x instead. And then we can do this invertible variable substitution, where minus x can be replaced with x prime without changing the set. So we do so, 
and we see that that is the set associated with the GCD of A and B. Um, and these sets were equal, so the GCDs are equal, and then that's that. Um, okay, so another property. If you scale two numbers and take the GCD, you could have simply scaled the GCD. And this is for C positive, because GCDs are positive and we don't want to be getting a negative number here. Okay, so to prove this, we look at the set associated with the first GCD, which is x times ca plus y times cb for all x and y. So we can factor the c out, and then uh, using a somewhat convenient uh, notation device, which is a number times a set, meaning taking the number times every element of the set, then we see that this is c times the uh, set associated with the GCD of a and b. Um, okay, so I recall from the proof of Bayes' theorem that the GCD of CA and CB is the least positive element of uh, the first set, where we use zero if the set ends up being empty. And um, also, the GCD of AB is the least positive element of the set that we're multiplying by C, and we use zero if it's empty. And hence, we have that the GCD of CA and CB is C times the GCD of A and B, since uh, C is greater than or equal to zero. Um, and the underlying reason for this is that whenever you have a least element of a set and you scale that set by some non-negative number, then you've scaled that element as well. So continuing the, these linear algebra analogies, there's also a sort of replacement rule for like a basis change. Um, so given a, b, and c that are integers, then the GCD of a and b is also the GCD of a and c, a plus b. So we can add some amount of one of the things that we're taking the GCD of to the other number. Uh, and this will end up being a very important thing for being able to calculate GCDs in an efficient way. Um, okay, so let's recall a little bit about how matrix multiplication works. So if we have x and y in the integers, then the product of the row matrix AB with the column vector xy is xA plus yb. So we can create these integer linear combinations by doing these matrix multiplications. And the set of all these one by one matrices of xA plus yb for x and z in the integers then can be written as the image of this matrix where what we're gonna, what we're thinking of, is the image where all the vectors are uh, have entries that are only integers. Okay, so let's check a little thing that will end up being useful, which is that when we take a b and then stick this matrix one c zero one in between it and x y, then we get something that is useful to us, which is. Um, x a plus y times c a plus b. And that's useful because this is the element that shows up for the set associated with uh, the GCD of a and c a plus b. And this is just a matter of multiplying it out and checking that related work. Um, and if you think back to linear algebra, where this matrix is coming from is the um, elementary row operation matrix. Anyway, so um, what this means is that the set of all one by one matrices, where the elements correspond to the elements for the set for that GCD, can then be written as the image of the product of these two matrices. Okay, so now here's the key step. The, this two by two matrix is invertible because I can write down an inverse and check that we actually get the identity matrix when we multiply them. And just like in linear algebra, um, and so if this is a fact you've forgotten, it's a good exercise to prove. The image, when you multiply a matrix on the right by invertible matrix, uh, ends up being the image of that matrix. And since these images are equal, all these one by one matrices, the set of these one by one matrices are equal. And so the set of just those values are equal. And so by that theorem from Bayes' identity, we know that the GCDs are equal. Okay, so that's this replacement rule. Now, an application of this is called the Euclidean algorithm. And um, 
you'll, and we'll see why this is an algorithm or why it gives an algorithm. So the theorem is that given two integers a and b with b positive, then we can calculate the GCD of a and b by instead calculating the GCD of b and a mod b. So remember the remainder after division. And what happens is that um, because the remainder is smaller than b, uh, if we sort of keep applying this, eventually all the numbers will decrease until they can decrease no more, uh, and then we can calculate the GCD easy from that. Okay, so the proof is uh, that if we have the GCD of A and B, then we can certainly swap it to be the GCD of B and A, and then um, using the division algorithm, we can write this as the GCD of B and floor divide a by b times b plus the remainder of a by b. And then uh, we apply replacement in reverse because this is just something times b, so we can subtract uh, that from this side to get just the GCD of b and a mod b. Okay, so how does this give an algorithm? Let's do an example. The GCD of 343 and 280. So um, what we do is we take 343 and 280, and uh, every step of the way, we take the second number and make it become the first. So each row here is a different step. And then the second number in each step is the remainder after division of the first number by the second. Um, so 343 divided by 280 gives remainder 63. So that's the second number, and 280 is the first, then 280 divided by 63 is remainder 28. So that's the second number and 63 is the first and so on and so forth until eventually we're left with just seven and zero. And by this theorem, each of these GCDs of these pairs of numbers are equal all along the way. And the GCD of a number and zero is that number, which you can check. That's a quick little exercise. Where before you might've thought to calculate GCDs, you had to enumerate all the divisors and find the common ones and find the maximal of them, turns out we can just apply this procedure and it takes far less time, um, at least for larger numbers where you can't just uh, find divisors in your head. So let's summarize what we talked about. Um, divisibility has interesting structure, as we saw from the Hasse diagram with all of those crisscrossing lines. And one aspect of that is the greatest common divisor, which um, gives at least some sense of, given two things in the Hasse diagram, at least what's something that they both have aligned to. And uh, the greatest common divisor also is connected to this world of linear combinations with integer coefficients uh, through Bezu's identity. And then using Bezu's identity in division, we were able to then calculate GCDs in an efficient way by doing this repeated process of dividing and taking remainders. And that's much better than enumerating divisors by calculating remainders for ever, uh, all the way up, um, as I hope you can agree. And then just one last thing. Uh, there's this really funny book by Carl Linderholm called Mathematics Made Difficult. And it pokes fun at some developments in math around the time that he was in graduate school. And it also seems to poke fun at G.H. Hardy with his uh, book, Mathematician's Apology. And there's this one uh, excerpt that is surprisingly applicable to what we were talking about today, which I'll read for you. The mathematical subject which we have been considering is all about dividing one number by another number in such a way as to get no remainder. It is easy to divide a number by another number, but it is not so easy to do it in such a way as to get no remainder. This task is by no means always easy. In fact, it is often impossible. This fascinating subject, together with all its ramifications, is called divisibility. People often devote their lives to a part of mathematics that they have chosen for various characteristics. Of course, until one has devoted his life to a part of mathematics, one cannot know for certain what the characteristics of the particular field actually are. And by the time one does know, it is often too late. One of the major criteria a mathematician looks for in choosing a subject to work in is uselessness. It is considered fun to do something really useless. One American mathematician had devoted much of his life's work to divisibility and related topics. 
In the autumn of a fruitful sojourn on earth, he rested on his laurels, gratefully remembering how useless his work had been. To fill the idle hours, he played with a dial of a radio receiver of the kind that can get anything. Picking up a ground air communication, he heard this. Hey Mac, how's the visibility up there? Pretty bad, Chet. How's the visibility there on the ground? Can't see a ting, Mac. Neither can I. Guess I better come on in. That's right, Mac. The visibility is one of the most important things when you're up in the air. On learning that his darling subject, on which he had spent the best years of his life, had applications to aeronautics, the poor man lost his mind and became a folk singer. His songs were based on the Pythagorean idea that music is applied arithmetic, and had titles such as a protest song based on the first Mersenne primes for sackbutt and thumb piano, or a contrapuntal imprecation based on 65537 for Ophicleide and Calliope, and 17 parts for horse vocalists, and won worldwide acclaim. Well, on that note, thanks for joining me on this journey through GCDs, and I'll see you next time.